of myself that you can associate a face with who's giving this talk. So my name is Stefan Peibisch. I'm Director of Scientific Computing, and today I'm going to talk about uh, towards reconstructing petascale scale light sheet microscopy data sets. Okay, let me switch into presentation mode. So uh, as you're all aware, modern developmental biology increasingly relies on solutions for imaging large samples with high resolution. And back in the days, this meant taking a full stack and uh, stitching the few tiles back together. That's actually when I got into image analysis of microscopy in the first place. This was 10, 15 years ago now. Today, this means uh, taking very, very large samples, expanded samples, maybe even with light sheet microscopy, and stitching terabyte and nearly up to petabyte sized images back together. The same actually uh, very related domain is uh, electron microscopy reconstruction of, for example, here entire uh, Drosophila central nervous systems that I'm not going to talk about, but lots of the tools that I'm going to talk about today are actually uh, very related to our work on EM data as well. So in another typical uh, um, case of uh, uh, large-scale data reconstruction is developing samples in light sheets, but as I said, the focus of today's talk is um, imaging uh, very large samples with microscopes such as the mesospin. So, and while microscopy is very, very important for this, right, and it has made an amazing development over the last years, software is, I think, just as important, right, because you need to reconstruct the data, you need to handle the data, and eventually you want to analyze the data, right? So the focus of my talk is more on the reconstruction side, but software, I think, is a very, very important step, step of making these beautiful microscope acquisitions actually useful and available uh, to the experimentalist. So let's talk a little bit about light sheet microscopy. So that's the classical setup. I mean, many of them are derived from this original 2004 Stelzer paper and even older, the Siedentorf Zygmondi ultra micro microscope, where you put your sample in front of an objective, in this case, uh, in the modern ages, usually hanging from a, a agarose column, you have your sample in there, or it can be embedded in some sort of uh, medium. And then it's held somehow in front of the objective and the light sheet comes from the side and you move your sample to the light sheet, creating a 3D stack. Again, you rotate your sample and you can also tile for each view, as we call it, each of them is a view where you rotate. You can tile hundreds or maybe even thousands of image stacks. And of course, those need to be reconstructed, right? And back in the days, uh, meanwhile, right, this paper is from 2019, but it's uh, two and a half years ago, we developed Big Stitcher. And this is a user-friendly tool that brings ImageLib2, Big Data Viewer, N5, HDF5 for storage to the experimentalist. It's a Fiji plugin that easily enables you to manage up to like a, let's say, one, two terabyte uh, size data. And you get this Google Maps-like access in terms of visualizing, but also processing. And this is a powerful tool that many of you might have heard about. And what it does, it, you know, it can deal with relatively large data sizes, as I mentioned, up to a few terabytes max, right? Uh, we manage things like data handling and compute time. You can do this in reasonable effort on your workstation. You can handle non-connected tiles, meaning tiles where there is no image content. It's quite robust, right? So uh, we put a lot of effort in the algorithms that they actually uh, work, even though some errors might occur. And it allows you to interact with the reconstruction. That's from our point of view, very, very important, right? Because things always go wrong. So what you can do, you can go in there and fix it. It actually handles, it can handle light operations, which means uh, simple things as illumination, sight detection, but can also mean uh, uh, chromatic aberrations and even non-rigid deformations that occur because uh, light is refracted as it goes through the sample. And another really cool thing is the uh, quality control. So it allows you to estimate the image resolution. Let's say rather, it allows you to esti estimate image quality at any point in the sample, which helps you as, as an experimentalist to then see, okay, was my sample acquired well? Did the clearing work everywhere? Did the acquisition work everywhere? So it's just a nice little tool uh, to you know, assess the sample quality. And then at the end, it fuses this into one gigantic stack that you then can analyze with whatever tools you want, deep learning, manual segmentation, and so on and so on. But I don't want to spend too much time focusing on Big Stitcher today. I just wanted to mention it for those for you who have, might not heard it, that this exists. You can check it out. It's a Fiji plugin. You activate the Big Stitcher update site and you're good to go. What I want to talk about today is, as I said in the talk, what is the future? Where does this all go, right? So the new effort is towards petascale light sheet microscopy acquisitions. People want to image entire human brains now on the light sheet microscope, right? And how they typically do this is with a different type of microscopy setup. They take the sample of interest. In this case, this is a, a proof of principle where they took a macaque, so a macaque brain, sliced this into non-overlapping sections, cleared each of, each of them individually, and then used a diaspim-like microscope to scan the entire sample and then put it back together. 
right? And I think this is one of the big directions where lightship microscopy uh, is heading these days, right? And what we want to do is want to develop as before with Big Picture, smart, scalable software that really works. So they actually did a proof of principle of software for this macaque brain, but you know, it's a it's a it's, it's a proof of principle, right? It's not something you can just take and apply to your data. So we want to step in here, we have a lot of experience and want to push Big Stitcher and related projects like uh, Stitching Spark at the Zyphed Lab developed the agenda here into a you know, powerful package that can handle from very small confocal acquisitions, largely terabyte up to the petascale size uh, data sets. And I want to just give you an example because we started working on one project here together with Stefan Seifeld, uh, uh, who's also a computer scientist. So we work on the construction side and we worked with Carol Swoboda, who is meanwhile at the Allen Institute and Tim Wang, and they, did, they built such a microscope as well that can scan large areas with light microscopy. And I just want to give you an idea, you know, uh, which direction our development is going. So I have to look at my timer from time to time, but I'm not running out of time. Okay, we're doing pretty well. So why do we need such a microscope setup compared to the classical Stelzer, Siedentopf, uh, uh, ultra microscope like? First of all, you have unconstrained sample access, right? If you, for example, slice your sample, it can be infinite, right? Because you move the stage down here and you can scan data that is as big as you want, right? This has a huge advantage uh, for these very, very large uh, samples. And then the computational challenges are very similar to the, to the, the classical osomesospin-like setup. You know, you need to do the stitching, alignment, and then for down, further downstream, you want to find single molecule fish spots and you might want to segment nuclei. And I'm going to touch on this a little bit at the end, just, uh, you know, as a, to give you some, uh, you know, reading notes if you're interested in this direction. Important for us is that this scales and is interactive to the petabyte range. This also means it's going to be exciting for mesospim, right? Because it, this data data sets can be very, very large and Big Stitcher comes to the edge of what, what works well on the workstation. So I think uh, this development will benefit also samples that are in the lower terabyte range because it will make your life much, much easier. And Doug Shepard and so on, they have working they help us uh, develop this and test this so they, they can tell you maybe also if they're here, I don't know, uh, that this can actually be useful for not petabyte scaled data sets as well. So I want to quickly explain to you what the difference is in the type of stacks that you acquire here, right? Uh, so compared to the classical setup here, you take a sheared data set, right? You have your images, X, Y, 2000 by 2000 pixels. That's the actual stage. And then you move your objectives along that stage. And you take something that is an image stack as you require it, but it's actually a parallelogram. And additionally, we get uh, some more issues because the shifts in X and Y are usually not integers and they're not constant. So the stage tells you this is whatever, a few microns, and then it ends up not being a few microns, but plus minus 5%. And I will show you that. So then you take these stacks, and then same as with the classical light sheet microscope setup, you take many, many, many stacks that cover an entire sample. And, you know, in this case, we had a total of 3.5 terabytes times eight, times eight rounds. And that's just one little part of the <laughs> mouse brain, right? So these things will get gigantic in the near future that we have to deal with. So what are the reconstruction steps that we need to do here? We need to unshear the data. We need to do pairwise channel alignment. That's something big that's actually not that good. That will improve significantly here with the software. Pairwise stitching and final assembly. So these things are very related to the big stitcher project. The big difference here is now that with this project, we do it on Spark, meaning you can distribute these things not only on your workstation, but also on the cluster or on the cloud. And that's the key in some sense. So but let's first talk about the unshearing. So this is how a stack looks as you acquire it from the microscope. And as you can see, it moves, right? So, so it's not the type of data you know to deal with. So what you actually need to do, you have to unshear the data, usually by the delta that you know from your microscopy stage. In our case, it's about 13 pixels per, uh, per z-plane. But as I said, that is actually not that correct. And I will show you what actually happens. So how do we find the correct overlap and the correct shear, right? So we do the same spiel that we always do we do with geometric local descriptor matching or SIFT combined with robust outlier removal and the regularized global optimization. So we find corresponding points between overlapping slices. Plus minus three, we do by default. And it's of course ideal if you have little dots, but it works with any type of content. And it's actually pretty robust also if some slices are black because you have this regularized global optimization, meaning we put this information in, meaning if there is no data, it will just do what the microscope, uh, what the stage tells you to do. So now when we solve this, this is the result for this microscope, right? You actually see that it's about 13 pixels in X, but you also see it's about 0.8 pixels in Y. And these types of things are important 
because later on, if you do a stitching of that, that means you might, otherwise you have to represent these deformations there. Now we've fixed this already, and this is a nicely isotropic stack. No, sorry, not isotropic, a nicely aligned stack. It's not isotropic, right? And Z, the, the stepping is still different. But the cool thing is that these stacks, you can, for example, align or using translation or rigid model if you have a smaller set. So this is really, really important. Plus, if you do things like single molecule localization, these changes are important, right? Because the PSFs are suddenly correct instead of being jittered. So this is then how the stack looks like if you actually reconstruct it. So it becomes this gigantic parallelogram, right? So if you would actually save that image, it would go from three gigabytes to 50 gigabytes, which is pretty crazy, right? So, but also developed, uh, Stefan Seifert wrote this, a virtual handling. So what we actually store to work with this data is the original stack plus the transformations for each slice which has few advantages. First of all, it stays three gigabytes. We can render whichever part of the stack we need, and we only need to interpolate once. You know, if you do this, uh, if you save the stack, you have to interpolate once just to create the stacks. Then you interpolate again to create the final output image. And that is not good because every time you interpolate, you lose image quality. So this is really, really uh, advantageous. And now we use this to align Carol's data, and this is very common to you know, whichever type of reconstruction you do. I showed this for this one data set, but again, these once released, this will be tools that uh, work for all types of data from the light sheet microscope, as long as they share somewhat similar characteristics. So what we do is we uh, look at, we have actually a few channels image at the same time. Some of them we can align using geometric descriptor matching, meaning finding little points and matching them. For that, we actually do split the data into little blocks. So we now support not only one affine transformation per block, but blockwise affine, meaning ultimately non-rigid alignment if you wish to do so and if you need to do so. So actually do a lot of these blocks. All of them is one job that's uh, executed independently on your local cluster, for example. And then we do the same thing again. We robustly identify points that overlap and that are, uh, sorry, that are corresponding. And we can do this uh, iteratively. You first do the find points, then we do the iterative closest point to find more points once you're very close to the result. Again, remove them using RANZAC. And at the end, we can do a non-rigid or a, not a non-rigid alignment. So this is just to give you an idea with Big Data Viewer, we zoom in and just visualize also, you know, which points were found. And as you can see, you do actually find a lot of points, which is great. So this usually works pretty robustly as long as the channels are similar enough. And that's of course up to the experimentalist to make sure. So now you see after aligning, some points are actually in common, but still we're able to register this robustly. And the same types of algorithms are already in Big Stitcher, right? There's, there's nothing new. The new thing is that it's blockwise, meaning you can it can change throughout the stack. And it can compute much faster since it's distributed. We then did the same thing actually for stacks where uh, um, point base does not work so well, where we actually used a uh, Fourier correlation. And even there, as you can see, the alignment we do the same thing, we split up a little blocks, we do the same thing, but we can still align the channels. So you have a choice between interest point based and uh, correlation based approaches. Now we have to stitch all these tiles together, right? And there are two ways of stitching this. Um, one of this, where the heads and stacks are next to each other, we again split into little blocks and compute the overlapping uh, corresponding features in the overlapping area, and then can again fuse using affine or non rigid or translation or whatever model that you actually want. And stacks can also overlap in this way, where the uh, overlapping area is actually smaller. But also this works pretty robustly, as you can see here, again, the visualization interactive uh, for Big Data Viewer. We find these corresponding points between the two stacks and then are able to put these things back together. And now, as you might have seen this before, so now we do pairwise all these things, right, for stitching, for color, and at the end, we throw this into one big global optimization where we minimize the distance between all corresponding points at once. Which at the end will give you a nicely aligned data set. And I will cut this short because we run out of time, but it end, at the end, it ends up with about five pixels uh, error. Let me just finish this. Sorry. Did you believe me? Oh, actually 1.5 pixels error. So, and then we can render this. So again, this is computed using Spark meaning this took uh, one hour to compute, but you know it can basically be as fast as you want, as much as you want to distribute. So it's only limited by the minimal drop size, and that's about one hour. So here we re reconstructed this gigantic, uh, about 10 terabyte data set, 
And then you can zoom in with Big Data Viewer. You can see all your little single molecule fish spots in this case that are interesting for studying uh, uh, development in the mouse brain. And the little shakings that you see here, that's actually not uh, an artifact of Big Stitcher. That is simply an experimental problem because there are some RNA that are not that attached and it actually wiggle around in the data set. And that's something that the experimentalists actually have meanwhile addressed, but that's still a little bit older data set. But it highlights how robust the whole reconstruction pipeline is, right? It can easily deal actually with those types of operations. So, as I said, one thing, the next thing to do is basically you slice this into little slices, right? Uh, same as with the monkey brain. So we actually developed for the EM project a deep learning model to predict a distance function from each slab which basically, I'm sorry, I'm showing the M data now, but that's what we're also gonna do for light microscopy data now. Basically, compute the distance, so red is positive, uh, yellow is negative, or vice versa, that's a little better, it's a distance function. And then you actually find the surface, and we do a graph cut that actually finds the surface robustly. So this software we already have, and we're gonna put into this package as well. And this was actually together with Habib and Jan Funke. So this way, we will allow us later to actually stitch many of these physical slabs back one on top of each other. So what is currently available for end users? So I showed a little bit of where it's going. What you can use right now, as I mentioned before, is Big Stitcher. It's a GUI app. You can download it, use it. Nikita actually made a nice uh, YouTube video. There are tutorials. Write me an email. Write a comment on, you, uh, on, on GitHub if you have any help, if you need any help. And even from the new project, some things are already available. So we started the Big Stitcher Spark repository, which for now allows you to do the most compute intensive part, which is the fusion after you line everything to fuse a gigantic data set. So Boas and Doug Shepard tried this out, even non rigid now takes only 3.5 hours and 200 cores, but before you were waiting almost a week to do this. So this is really cool. And this is you can use as well already. That's a bit more manual at this point, but it does work. So it works on your workstation and it's actually more efficient than the big stitcher code uh, that you have now. And it also works on the cloud or on the uh, cluster. But it might still need some development, but this is there and you can stitch terabytes and terabytes of data. So how are we going to take this from here, right? So at Janelia, we do have a new um, open science software initiative, um, which to which we have one project that will continue this work, as I described it now. An integrated scalable pipeline for large tissue sample light sheet image data reconstruction, where our goal is, as I mentioned, again, to keep this interactive, that you can go into the data and actually fix it, but also have a cluster and cloud deployable. And we will link into the tools that already exist, which include cell and nuclear segmentation using cell posts, Stardust. All these tools have been set up at Janelia for certain projects. We want to nicely integrate this. That is really just a few clicks going from one to the next. And one thing I don't have really time about as well, many people now want to do a single molecule for fish spot detection at very large volumes. So since I have uh, no questions in my session and... Uh, Two minutes left, I will just quickly give you an overview of that. So we developed RS Fish. Yeah, down here is the GitHub link. And it uses radio symmetry and uses a nice hack on radio symmetry, which is to combine it with, guess what? You're right, Ranzac, right? Which basically allows you to only find gradients around the spot that intersect in a point, right? Radio symmetry usually takes all of the gradients and intersects them, but often you have noise or something else that is close by, but this doesn't work. So here we compute the integrated image gradients and intersect them in one point. And this localization is as good as a Gaussian fit with the advantage that it's way, 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 way faster, right? So that's really cool. So we made a nice plugin with this. Again, a Spark implementation, which allows you to run this on very large volumes. It's much faster, it's easy to parallelize, easy to apply to large volumes, integrates into the feature for the ecosystem, Interactive parameter selection, macroscriptable. We have it as command line tool and it's cluster and cloud deployable as well. So here, for example, just an idea how this actually works. So you can tune even on small parts of an N5 volume. For example, you can tune these parameters, make sure they're right, they find the spots that you need, and then you run this. It's pretty fast, very accurate, right? So you can check out uh, the, the bioarchive link on RS Fish. You can see uh, in-depth comparisons. And we tried this on a lot of data sets, including very large volumes, which I think is uh, the important thing for this talk, right? So we used, for example, an easy fish volume. This is a, how big was this? I forgot, 150 gigabyte light sheet stack. And we ran this in 32 CPU hours, meaning on your workstation in an hour to, con to detect all points. And here we also wrote nice, you know, interactive uh, big data viewer visualization to overlay all the points onto your sample that then allows you to get an idea, did the single molecule fish detection actually work, yes or no? 
and did it work well. Okay, and this is actually interactively visualized 5 million detections, right? So this is pretty cool. Okay, that's it. I want to thank a lot of people. Marvan, uh, who, who moved over to SciComp, Friedrich, Ella, Laura in my lab, the people at SciComp, Habib, Mark, Kyle, Tobias, Eric, collaborators, Stefan Saalfeld, Tim Beng, Carlos Verboda, Jan Funke, Srini, Jerry, and all these people at Janelia. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please write me on Twitter, emails, and so on. Thanks so much, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye.